good afternoon. Uh, good morning to those on, on the West Coast. Um, and welcome to uh, the Healing Native American Youth Through Justice Reform webinar. Um, I'm Nate Bayless. I'm the director of the Juvenile Justice Strategy Group at the NE Casey Foundation. Uh, thank you all for joining us. This is a really important topic uh, and one that I'm really excited that we can talk about uh, as a community uh, here on uh, JDI Connect. So, um, you know, I think as, as I hope everyone who's coming here today knows, although the number are relatively low, Native American youth have been consistently the most overrepresented racial and ethnic group in the nation's juvenile justice system. Um, in recognition of this, 10 years ago, the Annie Casey Foundation partnered with uh, the Federal Justice Department through the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention to adapt JDAI in Native American communities. We partnered with the National Indian Child Welfare Association, the Association of American Indian Affairs, and the W. Haywood Burns Institute to inform and launch this work. Our first Native American JDI site was the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, and later we engaged the Pueblo of Isleta in New Mexico. The Burns Institute provided technical assistance in both of those places. We learned a lot about partnering with sovereign nations through this work. Um, we later supported a survey of JDI sites by the Association of American Indian Affairs to determine how JDI sites, specifically those that encompass or are adjacent to tribal communities, um, entangle many Native American youth. Part, uh, we partner with Native, Native communities, identified and served Native youth, and, and notified tribes when Native youth were arrested. All of these were, were issues that were addressed um, in the survey. And the AAIA issued the results of that survey in 2018, which revealed that despite a few bright spots, most JDI sites um, that responded did not have formal relationships with tribal communities or have accurate methods to identify Native youth or their tribal affiliation. Today, uh, we will hear more from AIA about working with Native American youth and tribes to explore JDI site interest and technical assistance and training to improve the work of working with young people, uh, Native American young people and tribes. So um, with that, I will, um, I will pass this to Colleen from AIA. Thank you, Nate and uh, Ani Bojo Kinawaya. Hello, everyone in my Anishinaabe Moan language. My name is Colleen Medicine, and I'm a citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians and the program director with the Association on American Indian Affairs. And I want to welcome each and every one of you to today's webinar, Healing Native Youth Through Youth Justice Reform. Um, thank you. You can move to the next slide. Here we are. And so I just want to share a little bit of information with you about the Association on American Indian Affairs. We are a 101-year-old organization. We celebrated our 100th year last year in 2022. And we are a membership organization started in 1922. And since the beginning of uh, the association, we have always been committed to children and families. And our current Native Youth Justice work centers around building a Native Youth Justice community of practice and providing education to state and local jurisdictions. Um, and this initiative is in partnership with the Annie E. Casey Foundation, of course. Um, you see our vision mission goals here. I'm not going to read them out loud, but um, they're fairly short, so go ahead and read them. You can see um, that our goals are to protect, uh, protecting sovereignty, preserving culture, educating youth, and building capacity. Thank you, Shannon. Can move to the next slide, please? Okay, so you're going to see some polls come across your screen. I'm not really going to share much about them um, up front in the beginning. Um, it's going to ask you two questions. Uh, feel free to be very honest in those questions. There's no harm here in answering them truthfully. We're just trying to gauge the room and see where we're all at. So the questions will come up for you in just a moment. 
and you'll be able to respond to those and then we'll look at the results after this slide here. Um, so, oh, here they are. <laughs> okay, so in 2018, the association um, conducted a study and of course, Nate um, shared uh, briefly about this in his introduction that um, the results of that study essentially uh, revealed that JDAI sites um, or the responding sites did not have a reliable process for identifying native youth, um, nor did those responding sites um, have much engagement in outreach to native youth's families or nations or to gather information on the youth status as a citizen or a potential citizen of a native nation. Um, since the, these, uh, that research also came with some uh, recommendations from coming out of that, and, and those recommendations were really um, centered on building relationships with Native youth and building relationships with Native nations, perhaps building out MOUs or MOAs with those Native nations, developing notification and identification protocols and including culturally appropriate services for Native youth. Um, and, and, and so that brings us really um, here today where we're providing this uh, webinar building off of those recommendations in 2018. So I think the, the results are ready. So if we could pull up the questions here. Okay. So a little bit of mixed results, which is really good. Um, seems to be that some of you are unsure. Some of you said yes, some said no. This is great. Um, so we're just gonna dive deeper into what it means to work with, with tribes and, um, and how you build relationships with them. So this is really great. And if we could just see the results for number two. Oh, we'll ask number two. <laughs> and so this question is asking, does your jurisdiction right now have a way to determine if a youth is Native American or has a tribal affiliation. Um, there's potentially options here. If you ask the parent, if you're using a parent surname by contacting a tribe or none of the above, and, and that's okay too. So we'll just give one more moment to, to have folks uh, respond to the poll, and then we'll take a look at the results. Wow, this is really surprising. And not one, not one response about appearance. That's that's great. Okay. So the, the youth are asking the youth or parent pretty much seems to be um, the consensus here today. Okay, that's really great. Thank you. We'll come back to these results later on if we can move to the next slide, please. Oh boy, this is gonna be my favorite part today, I think. So I just want to say that this isn't going to be a typical webinar and that I'm not just going to sit here and talk at you and give you information. In fact, I think it's really important for us to really be present and, and connect in this space so that we can be here as learners together. And so I have a short embodiment and connection activity I'd like to share with you. I know it might seem a little awkward for you. Um, it can be in a space like this, but please know that we're all going to do it together and you're welcome to turn your cameras off. Um, actually, I don't think you, anyone can see you right now anyway. So this is um, a perfect time for you to really lean into it and relax and just take a moment for yourself as we settle into the webinar. So um, I'm gonna give you some prompts. It's gonna be like a guided uh, breathwork meditation, okay? And hear me out, I know, I know. It, it seems odd, but but we'll we'll work through it together. It can be really great for us to take a moment for ourselves. We often don't do that um, as we are working, right? So I'm going to first invite you to sit or stand comfortably, whatever makes sense for you. If you like your feet firmly on the ground, I invite you to put them there. Perhaps you like your feet tucked under one under the other or under your butt. However you feel comfortable sitting is exactly how I'd like to have you. Um, and feel free to place your hands on your thighs or maybe you wanna let them dangle, whatever feels comfortable for you. Um, and I'm going to ask you to just breathe in this moment in through your nose and out through your mouth. And let's just do that one more time together, in through our nose, 
and out through our mouths. And I invite you to say soft as you inhale and belly as you exhale. And if you can imagine that as you're breathing and you can say that to yourself, um, soft inhale, belly on the exhale. And really focus on the expansion that occurs in your chest as you inhale and what that feels like for you. And then bringing your attention to the deflation in your chest as you slowly exhale. And what does that feel like for you? So let's just keep taking a minute to breathe in through your nose, soft, out through your mouth, belly, in through your nose, Soft, out through your mouth, belly. And in this moment, I invite you to think of one thing you feel gratitude for today. One thing that you are just grateful for. Maybe it's for another day. Maybe it's for your family or for your work. Maybe it's for the warm food you had today or the person who prepared your warm food. Maybe it's for the roof over your head or the job that you have. Maybe it's the vehicle you drove today. Um, maybe it's for relief from a trouble that you've been experiencing. Let's just take a moment to really be grateful for whatever that thing is and let it fulfill your heart in this moment. We're going to breathe just a couple more together in through our nose, soft, out through our mouths, belly. And let's do that two more times together in through your nose, soft, and out through our mouth, our belly. One more time together. In through your nose, soft. And out through your mouth, belly. When you are ready, and only when you are ready, maybe you want to wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers, and slowly bring ourselves back to the present. If your eyes were closed, maybe you open your eyes. Um, give yourself a big stretch. Just really feel it, stretch up into the air. And the reason that I have you doing this activity, I'm sure some of you are wondering, is that I think it's very important to bring us to the present moment and really allow ourselves to be truly present. I know for me, a lot of times when I attend webinars, I'm working in the background, right? And I'm not fully engaged, but I really wanna invite you to come with your learner's cup and your empty learner's cup and, and really be present. And so this, this mindful breathing kind of brings us to the present. It also stimulates a lot of relaxation in our body um, physically. And we never take time to ourselves during the day, right? And I think it's important to do that because the youth that we work with really need us to be present. And so sometimes just taking a few minutes to breathe really brings us back to the present and we can fully show up for those that we serve. So the next slide is also gonna be a little activity for us, I'm really excited about. Um, this is a short, about four minute video. It's a Michael Jr. video called, What Is Your Why? And we're gonna just take a few minutes to watch this video. And as you're watching it, I invite you to just think about what is your why? Why did you come here today? Why did you choose youth justice as your field of work? Um, what brings you here? And just focus on that as you're watching and just please enjoy. It's a really great video. So here we go. 
How do I know? A lot of people, when they think of the phrase, how do I know, they always want to put the what behind it. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? The, the question that you really should ask is, how do I know why I'm here? Because when you know your why, your what becomes more clear and more impactful. If you know, like for instance, um, people know that I do comedy, but that's what I do. My why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. So I can do comedy, I can write books, I can be in a movie, because all of it is motivated by my why. In fact, I have a new, uh, a new web series out called Michael Jr. Break Time. Uh, we probably just did the sixth episode, it's on YouTube. So every single Wednesday at three o'clock, we drop a new episode on YouTube of Michael Jr. Break Time. What it is, is it's me, I travel around the country and I do stand-up comedy, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and in the middle of my comedy set sometime, I'll stop and just talk to my audience. And we've been filming this and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. So <laughs> we're in Winston-Salem. I'm gonna show you a clip from Winston-Salem. And I'm just talking to this guy in the audience and he tells me that he's a, uh, a musical instructor at a school. So I was like, all right, you're a musical instructor, you know, can you sing? Let me hear you sing a song. So this is what happened at the last episode of Michael Jr.'s Break Time. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let, me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Me, go ahead. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. Wow. That brought could sing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> all right, all right. Um, now, what you give me the version is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that says. Okay, um, here's what I want you to catch. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what becomes more impactful because you're walking towards or in your purpose. Ooh. I think that video gives me goosebumps every time. Um, I want to invite you all to share your why in the chat. Um, I'd love to give maybe 30 seconds to a minute if there's somebody who would like to come on and share your why with the group. Um, if not, I would just invite you to put it in the chat and share with others so we can, can read them. And when we, when we know what we're doing, you saw in the video, it was good enough, right? By all means, that was still a great uh, song that he provided. But when he was told his why, of course, it was extraordinary. And I think that's just the, the takeaway here is sometimes we forget about our why and it helps us be more dedicated to the youth that we serve, right? Um, so if, if there is anyone, I can't see if anyone raised your hand or anything, but if there is anyone who would like to voice your why, I'd be happy to turn it over to you for just a moment. Yeah, Colleen, I have Mark here that raised his hand. Mark, if you can unmute yourself, that would be great. 
Um, hello, my name is Mark Dye. I actually work with um, the American Probation and Parole Association. I'm the Tribal Grants Manager. Um, I spent 10 years uh, working in the field as a probation officer. Um, and my why that I do this, um, and I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, um, I was in college and um, my best friend who I'd met in fifth grade, we, we grew up together, we were bros, he was my best man at my wedding. And I, um, I was in college and I went to college late. And so I was actually in the middle of a training, I mean, a, a research project on Native American, Native American use and abstinence of alcohol. And during that time, my, um, my best friend's mother asked me to talk to him because all he was doing was drinking. And I said, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. I'm a little busy. I'll get to it. Um, next time I saw him was at his funeral. Um, we buried my best friend who died at the age of 32 from cirrhosis of the liver. And we buried him on September 11th, 2001. So when the world was changing, my life changed completely. Um, I never said anything to him because I was afraid of losing him as a friend. And so I, I lost him anyway. Um, and I had, and I never said anything, nearly destroyed me. Um, almost dropped out of school, almost dropped out of college. Um, what changed it for me was I got the opportunity to attend a conference in Crystal City, Virginia, Veterans Day weekend, 2001. And I stayed right across the street from the Pentagon. And you could see the hole where the building had collapsed. It was at that point I realized that I, I couldn't let this happen again. And so... At that point, I decided that I would say whatever needed to be said to whoever needed to hear it in order to prevent this from happening again to anybody else. And so I took the approach of, I'm going to say what needs to be said, even if it costs me a friend, because I would rather have somebody hate me for 40 years than love me for four and be gone. And I spent the next 10 years working for my tribe, adults and youth. I ended up being a wellness court coordinator. I ended up being um, probation manager, an advisory board member. Um, and, and I spent the next 10 years making sure that there are folks that are still alive because of something I said. Um, one of those friends that I said something to is now a certified peer support worker. And she came through our wellness court program. Wow. Uh, there's some folks that won't talk to me anymore. There's some folks whose families won't talk to me anymore, but that person is alive and has made changes in their life. Mm -hmm. That's the why on why I do this for 20 years, because we all know this is not easy. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for, for sharing your story openly. Um, and, and we appreciate that because the whys are so impactful for all of us. Um, and thank you to everyone sharing your whys in the chat. I've been able to glance at a couple of them and they're very powerful. Um, thank you so much. So we are going to go back to the PowerPoint and really dive into the meat and potatoes now that we've had a little bit of fun and we got to know each other a little bit. We kind of have to dive into the, the harder conversation here of, of how did we, you know, how did we get here, right? And historical trauma, um, I'm not going to read this slide. Go ahead and, and read the, the small definitions here. But, um, you know, historical trauma um, has traveled through our, our throughout time and affects our youth today so much so that, of course, they're entering the system at disproportionate rates. And um, the major takeaway that I want to say here about historical trauma is that it's collective and it's intergenerational. So um, it impacts us from the past, it impacts us here in the present, and it will undoubtedly impact our future generations. Um, and, and, and so those traumas that occurred historically were felt at that time, but they're still felt today and they will be felt in the future. Um, historical traumas are often related to one group being oppressed. And of course, we know some examples of that, right? 
uh, slavery, the Holocaust, and of course the attempted genocide of Native American people. And if you know anything or have heard anything, read anything about um, epigenetics, um, there's been a lot of research lately that suggests that we pass on uh, more in our DNA than just genes, right? It suggests that our genes act, can actually carry memories of trauma experienced by our ancestors and can influence how we react to trauma and stress here in the present. And so I encourage you to check out some epigenetics research. There's a lot of it going on nowadays. Um, but uh, the, the takeaway here is that historical trauma, uh, it was intentional, it was collective and intergenerational, and it's impacting our youth today. Um, we can move to the next slide. And one other really important part about historical trauma is that it often includes um, the loss of land or the loss of connection to land. And in this case, and what we're talking about today, you know, the Native American population here in the United States uh, through federal Indian policies of removal and assimilation were often up, uh, moved, removed from their homelands, removed from that connection to land. Um, and, and displaced. And that left a lot of our people still displaced even today without that lack of connection or with a lack of connection to their tribal community, to their native nation, to their language, ceremonies. All of, all of that is intrinsically connected to the land. And, and how I wanna really uh, take that one step further is, is to give an example of what an a connection to the land might look like, right? Because we can say that all day, but it's really hard to envision that if you're not as connected to the land, right? And so, um, for instance, I one time uh, heard from an elder that there is a sacred site where he comes from that only the air at that sacred site grows certain organisms and, and the air is a certain way in that spot. And it is the only spot the air is like that. And so that is the only place that certain ceremonies can be conducted. Another example, um, a lot of times um, our, our, uh, like the water from a certain place is connected to rites of passage ceremonies for young women. And that water cannot be replaced with water from other places, right? Okay, so you can see that there's so many connections to land, but historical trauma has really displaced our people from land. And because of that lack of connection to land, um, we oftentimes don't have as connect, uh, we're not as connected to language, right? Um, my language is Anishinaabe Moan, and it's a descriptive language. And so basically what our ancestors saw is what they made words for, right? So like, for instance, the word strawberry is actually the word for heart in my language because it looks like a heart, right? And so when we're not connected to land, we lose out on that connection to ceremony and identity and therefore um, brings us into places um, where we're taking risky behaviors, right? Where, and especially our youth are impacted by this. And so um, it's almost like a, the perfect recipe that lands our youth right into the justice system. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so how, how did we get here? Well, first I wanna say boarding schools, Indian Adoption Project and Child Welfare, they're all, assimilation <laughs> tactics in a way. I'm just going to be very frank about that. Um, and then, of course, when we couple those with ongoing trauma, again, it is the perfect recipe that lands our youth into the system. Um, you know, boarding schools, I'm sure that many of you have heard a little bit about them, but federally funded boarding schools um, was a way to disrupt culture. It was a way to essentially try to stamp out and eradicate Native people by taking the children and cutting off the language and the culture at the children and therefore uh, cutting it off from any future generations. And our young people were met with a lot of violence there and many of them lost their lives. And so of course, if we think back a couple slides and we're talking about DNA and epigenetics and we can understand then how that violence and that 
um, loss of language and culture from boarding schools has traveled through time and is still impacting our youth today. Um, in regards to the Indian Adoption Project, that occurred around 1959 through the late 60s. It was essentially a social experiment uh, with the lives of Native children. It was funded by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the agency employed to protect the affairs of Indian people, um, but implemented by the Child Welfare League of America. And the purpose was to remove any obstacles to allow Native children to be raised by white families. So this was another way that children were directly stolen without consent from their families and their communities and placed into non-Native uh, households. And it is estimated that at least 25 to 35% of Native children had been removed and raised in non-Native homes during that time. That's a huge number of children that were taken, which creates, again, that lack of identity and connection and of course, when we see in child welfare practices, we do have the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is absolutely wonderful in keeping our children um, in community and in our families, right? But we also see some, some gray areas with child welfare practices, for instance, private adoption, um, still, still um, kind of um, um, operating outside the parameters of the law and still able to you know, take children out of community even today. So this is still going on and impacting our youth. And so if you couple all of the kind of those historical um, um, issues of boarding school, child welfare, adoption practices, and then you stick them in with these current ongoing traumas, for instance, um, you know, Alaska Native and American Indian youth are 50% more likely than their non-native uh, peers to uh, receive punitive measures, including things like pepper spray, restraint, isolation, and out of home uh, placement. The other thing that I find very interesting is that um, the that sixty percent of the justice population uh, or the juvenile justice population, the youth justice population, is comprised of Native American and Alaska Native youth. Sixty percent, so that's pretty huge. And uh, some of these ongoing traumas that that our youth are facing um, are things that I think are probably out of their hands, right? Um, they're facing these historical and ongoing traumas that oftentimes land them in, in bad situations and probably into your offices and, <laughs> and uh, their name on your paperwork, right? But um, some of these things are simply just, you know, they're products of the environment they're growing up in. And we see that nearly one in five Native youth have substance use disorder, one in five. Suicide happens to be the second leading cause of death for Native youth ages 10 to 24. In fact, where I live, I, I live in a very, very small place in Northern Michigan. We have a higher suicide rate of Native youth than the national average. So we are definitely losing our youth to suicide. Um, and we see a, a huge um, increase in violence, including intentional injuries, homicide, unintentional suicides, intentional suicides, and those account for 75% of deaths of, of American Indian and Alaska Native youth ages 12 to 20. And other things like trafficking, we see a lot of that happening now, trafficking um, uh, Native women and children. We see a lot of domestic violence. And of course, even when we compared Native youth in terms of health to other uh, non-Native peers, we even see like, for instance, Native youth have higher rates of diabetes, which um, if you really think about it, could be directly, you know, uh, traced back to, again, historical trauma when we talk about, you know, the, the food rations that were given to our people. Um, they were oftentimes given the most unhealthy food items to contribute to their household. And so we oftentimes do see higher health disparities in Native youth because they're often still receiving those food rations even today. Um, so we can move to the next slide. All right. So um, 
of course, again, Native youth are responding to that trauma, right? That's a lot to have to work through as a young person to experience that historical trauma in your very DNA, but also be in a situation where you're experiencing ongoing trauma and not really getting the, the healing you need, right? And then the system that you're landed in is oftentimes punitive instead of restorative. And we know, all of you know here today, all of us are committed. That's why you're here, I'm sure, that Native youth need healing, not necessarily punishment in the way that we normally think about it. And so how, right? That's the million dollar question. How, how do we get there? Um, we can move to the next slide. Um, and, and the how is you right? You are the answer. And, and that's simple. Uh, um, and that you are the ones on the ground working directly with youth and you can bring that help, that good healing, that good medicine. And it's by choosing to partner and build relationships with Native nations. And we have a wonderful example of a Native nation, a federally recognized tribe here in Michigan, who has done uh, years and years and years worth of work building up diversion programs and uh, working to um, facilitate relationships with the state with other state and local jurisdictions. Um, we can move to the next slide. Um, unfortunately, my, my co-presenter, Mr. Patrick Wilson, was unable to be here with us today. And so um, I'm and um, Chief Judge Angela Sherrigan, she's also not here today, but has to, uh, we have a wonderful audio clip we're going to listen to from Angela. But before we do that, I just want to say a little bit about um, the diversion program at the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians. Um, the diversion program was actually um, dreamed of, um, created, and implemented by Patrick Wilson, who is the supervisor of the probation and peacekeeping department there. And um, as an elder in his community um, and, and someone who cares so much about the young people, he thought of this program and, and coined it uh, Band of Warriors. And it's really to build up the youth and to help them understand their responsibilities to communities, to really build them into warriors, um, into the community. And some of it has, um, there's definitely some um, uh, working with uh, the with elders, they partner the youth with elders in the community so they get to learn from the elders and really um, grow into themselves, create that identity that may not be there, have that connection to an elder, to a community that might not be there. And so as you hear uh, Chief Judge Angela Sherrigan speaking, she's going to refer to this program, Band of Warriors. And so I wanted to share that with you ahead of time. Next slide, please. And um, as you're listening to Angela, and she is just fantastic. Uh, she, this is gonna be a little bit of a long audio clip. I think it's about 12 and a half minutes. So please just relax and be open to listening because this has some of the most fantastic information in it. Um, what I really want you to pay attention to as you're listening is um, Judge Sherrigan is gonna lay out the foundation of, of the sovereignty that little, um, little River Band of Ottawa Indians has and how its membership um, voted on its constitution, which allows its court to operate in the way that it does. You'll hear her talk about how youth enter their system and you'll hear her talk about the musts, and those are the protocols that the youth must do inside that program. You'll hear her talk about the partnerships and relationships with other jurisdictions. Um, and you'll also hear her talk about how they treat youth in her program. And I pay special attention to the passion that she brings when she's talking. Um, I think it's just a fantastic audio clip. So we're gonna play it, please enjoy. Uh, here we go. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background information first, because our, our program that we use is um, it's pretty novel, I think. And so I think it's important to tell you how Little River Court is set up so that um, if there's questions of, well, how can you do that? It's because the uh, tribal government and when the, the members of the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians um, voted on their constitution, they gave pretty broad powers to the court. So 
The court is actually a court of general jurisdiction and we're membership based, which basically means two things. One, we can hear all types of cases and two, that we can take cases from anywhere. So you don't have to be in our nine county service area. Um, anywhere within Michigan, we have done um, something in Ohio. I'm not sure how we got away with it, but we did. And we do things in Wisconsin. So it's really great to have that, that broad um, power and authority to do that. So getting to our program, when um, youth come into the justice system, they come into our court in one of two ways. First is through Little River, you know, a complaint um, often through the prosecutor's office or through the P Department of Public Safety. So that is, you know, our jurisdiction, they're usually within the reservation boundaries or within the nine county reservation um, service areas. The second is um, through state courts that have an established relationship with our court. And that is something that, <laughs> really takes a lot of time to develop. Um, I've been working on it for probably 15 years. <laughs> and we have some good relationships with counties surrounding us, and we have some bad relationships. So not everyone is going to um, <clears throat> appreciate what we're trying to do. And this, the last way that they come into our court is if there is unfortunately a an abuse neglect case currently going on, and then they end up somehow in the um, in the juvenile justice system, and I'm talking about state courts. So in those cases, what I usually do is I call up to the, um, the judge that has the case and let them know that we have <laughs> that child under our jurisdiction through an abuse neglect case, and would that judge be willing to transfer it over to my court? It's about 50-50, but it's important to do that for a couple of reasons. One is it's important to have one judge per family. So if you have all these different judges, nobody actually gets to the root of the problem. If I already have the NA case, the abuse neglect case, and I find out that you know the child has now been charged with um, truancy or delinquency or something, then I can incorporate that into my abuse and neglect case. Often those types of cases, we find the kids are really reaching out because they're not feeling that they're hurt, being hurt. So <clears throat> again, that's like 50-50. Some judges say yes, some judges say no. It's really nice when they say yes. And the other reason is that we don't necessarily wanna give a child who already is in an abuse and neglect situation a record which is exactly what will happen in state court. And from there, they're, they're gonna be labeled as the bad kid from there on out. And it might just be a consequence of what the child is going through in the abuse and neglect case. So then they come into court, it's all formal, right? The first time that we see them, it's very, very formal. We immediately close all of our juvenile cases so that um, the public is not allowed to come into those hearings and we don't list them on our docket. We just put NA or um, we just put the case number so nobody knows what child that is. So we start out and get a feel of what is going on and have the, the child will either admit responsibility or not admit responsibility. We don't like to use the word guilty or not guilty. It's responsibility. And I think that's very important for the mindset of what is being set up for the child's future. But once they re admit responsibility, we're gonna um, send them over to see Patrick Wilson, who is our peacemaker probation officer. I'm really happy to see him there. I haven't seen him in a long time. So they'll go and they'll see Pat. Pat will kind of get a feel of what's going on, what actually happened. And then he'll make a report to me and we'll come back and we'll have our um, consequences hearing. And that, hearing is one that we do in person. There's only a couple that we're gonna do in person right now with COVID. We're still doing pretty much everything by Zoom. But the consequences hearing in person and the, the final review is in person also. 
And for the consequences, we have a couple must. Must are the child must write a letter of apology if the, per if the action that the child took was against someone that um, he or she does not know. If they do know the person, then the apology has to be um, in person. Unless the child, I, I had one that, you know, couldn't say it in person and I allowed that child to, to write it. But that is one of the absolute things that we have to have them do from the very beginning. Of course, they have to report to Pat for the whole term. Um, usually the period is anywhere from six months to a year. I like to keep it usually at a year because you really can't get a feel for the child in a, a six months, hurry up, let's get all of this done time frame. Um, another must is community service. Now it's not like community service in the justice systems where they give you a list of places you can do community service at and you get a signature and then turn it back in. Our community service for the youth are very um, limited and usually it is helping out with elders, um, either preparing lunch or doing, you know, minor jobs for them if it, you know, if the weather permits, like helping around the house or doing some type of weeding or cutting the grass, depending on the age of the child. And the reason that we do this is it gives them an opportunity to build a relationship um, with that elder that they might not have a relationship with someone outside of the family. And it also gives them the opportunity to feel what it's like to do something good for someone else and see that recognition of, yes, you helped me. Um, and then oftentimes, you know, those conversations start. And so that is one of the things that we do. If they are not close to the area or to the reservation, um, I'll ask them, what is it that you like to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? So we had one child who said that um, she wanted to be a veterinarian. So her community service was um, volunteering at the animal shelter. So it, it kind of gives them an idea uh, or a feeling that they're part of their growth. Another must is they have to stay in school. That's an absolute must, and that is always a, a big tricky one. And then the others um, that are not absolute must, because all of these are going to be individualized, right, is and specialized to um, the child. Uh, we um, find out, you know, usually Pat finds out if the child needs counseling and if that's individual or family, and find out whatever else they need so that we can fashion the order um, to help them out. We had one where there was a problem with school. The, the child kept, you know, not going to school or getting in trouble in school. And so we brought her in, found out what was going on, and it was the IEP had not been updated according to um, state law the way that it should have been and she wasn't in the proper classes and it was causing all kinds of problems. So we tried to get that fixed. Unfortunately, um, the school was not working with us very well. So we brought in an attorney for the family and then that was quickly settled. But then, you know, the, the child started doing better in school. So, um, and that's one of the things that we can tell state judges that maybe a little um, nervous about handing over their cases to a tribal court is we have the resources, we have time, we know that your court is very busy, we know that your probation departments are very busy, we know that state funds are limited, we have all of that that we can provide to you. So currently in the state of Michigan, um, we're technically not allowed to do that, state courts are not allowed to transfer cases to tribal court other than Indian Child Welfare Act cases, the abuse and neglect cases. So the Mason County judge that I work with, who's absolutely fantastic, him and I came up with this idea of how we could do this and how we could get around the, the rule in a legal way. So what we're currently doing is he 
once he gets a, a case brought in, as soon as he finds out that the, the child is um, a member of Little River, a citizen of Little River, he will send it to us under um, alternative services. So then once it comes into us under alternative mm -hmm. services, we treat it as the as the case and we go on with the full case. At the end of the time period, um, we come back for the final hearing. And so this is our conclusion hearing. This one is one that we have in, in person also. If the case started in state court, um, I will, before the, the hearing, usually like a week or two before, I will file a report to the judge in the state court and tell him that I'm going to be wrapping up the case. And usually the judge will um, wrap up his case also because they have to close things out in state court because they have to keep numbers and records and report to the Supreme Court. So I also invite them to come to the hearing and sit with me on the bench as um, co-judge. So that's building the relationships between the the courts as you know, like this benefit that we didn't even think about at the time. So they come in um, and then we congratulate them. We usually have a gift for them. And then what I really like about our program is when we're all done, we take the file, the literal court file, and we go outside in the back of the court with them and we tell them, okay, now this part of your life is over. You have done what it is that you needed to do to correct the behavior that brought you into the court system and we're gonna burn your file. So no one will ever know about it unless you tell them. And we allow the child to um, start the file. Yeah, so what, what uh, you're hearing at the end there is Angela talking about um, the, the actual physical burning of the youth's file, which I think is just a fantastic practice and very, very, um, I think, uh, uh, really impactful for that youth too. And so um, we're definitely most thankful for um, Chief Judge Angela Sheridan for providing us this audio clip that was just fantastic. I just wanna say, if you have questions directly for Judge Sherrigan, um, we are happy to field those to her. She definitely wants to respond to them and apologizes that she couldn't be here. Um, next slide, please. So I wanna... So I know that, um, judging from the polls that we uh, did earlier, that there's a little bit of mixed um, um, experience here in this space of working with uh, Native youth and Native nations. And it might seem daunting or um, hard, hard to understand or, or even not even knowing what the first step is, right? And so um, I wanna just highlight some of these keys to success as you are approaching Native nations and wanting to build those relationships that the key, uh, to that is partnership and relationship building, meaningful consultation, remediation, and building resiliency. And what I mean by that is really um, diving into partnership and relationship building is literally just crucial, right? And, and it also has to be rooted in the equitable ownership of the work and the outcomes, right? Um, and so agencies may have jurisdiction, but tribal nations often hold the expertise of the family, the community, the culture, the history, the connections to family and to government. And, and you heard uh, Judge Angela Sherrigan say that oftentimes tribes have the resources and the time too. And so that partnership becomes crucial. Um, and, and building partnership does not allow the responsibility for the work to rest on the shoulders of the, you know, the, the state or the local jurisdiction, nor does it allow the, the weight to be held from the, the Native nation. It really, really should be equitable in 50-50 for the best outcomes for youth. And uh, meaningful consultation, and I think this one can get really just bogged up because the word consultation just seems like such a fancy word for, for 
for something that really is about being face to face with the people, right? And so it's more than a letter being sent, a phone call or a box checked. It's about truly coming face to face, meeting in a safe spot that's accessible to everyone. Oftentimes native tribes have elders working with them that know this knowledge and uh, like and need to have spaces they can enter that are accessible. So even thinking about, you know, um, providing a space where there's not a lot of stairs so that those elders can can come and be part of that conversation. But tribal expertise and recommendations need to be sought out and, and given meaningful consideration. It's, it's not merely an opinion, but it includes making room for and taking to heart that native nation expertise that can help you to serve those youth. And when we talk about remediation, um, it really requires us to do a little bit of truth telling. It requires us to acknowledge that past harms have occurred, right? The system has, has been hard for, our, for native youth and, and all youth really, that both historically and ongoing trauma um, are, are still happening to native youth. And um, remediation really means that we're gonna ensure that those same harms don't happen again, right? We're, we're gonna build those relationships. Um, we're gonna partner with native nations and, and remediation should naturally occur as the, those relationships are built. And I think I added resilience in here because I love it. I think it's empowerment. And a lot of times our native youth just feel very deflated, right? Um, when they're entering the system, they've already clearly had some tough uh, uh, experiences. And so this, um, this can really help us um, as those who provide services to youth, we can help youth build up their resilience and their resilience factors. Um, next slide, please. So thank you uh, for being here today. Thank you for your commitment to standing with Native youth. And thank you for taking a moment to remember your why. Um, next slide, please. I think that might be. And I just want to also say here, you can take your smartphones out and use that QR code, or you can use the link here. But this is will bring you to a Google form that essentially will um, um, help you um, register if you're looking for more information, more training, more technical assistance, you have a question of something that you saw here today that you want to follow up on, I encourage you all to use that QR code or link. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, I didn't leave much time for questions, but here's our two minutes for questions. <laughs> and here's my information. Please reach out to me if you uh, have any questions or follow up or even a comment. I'd love to hear from you all. Thank you so much for listening to me today and, and sharing space with me and, and walking through this webinar. Um, yeah, so I'll turn it over to Brian maybe, or should I just look for questions? I'm not sure. Uh, I think we still have two minutes. So we can, yeah, we still have a couple of minutes for questions. This is Shannon. I'm happy to um, uh, either read your question in the chat if you have a question or um, if you raise your hand, Brian can pull you up so you can uh, speak with Colleen. And Shannon, I have Micah here uh, that, ha that raised their hand. Micah, you should be able to unmute yourself now. I have a, thank you guys for what you're doing. Um, I have a quick question. Um, how have you guys been able to address the education gap um, from the res to public schools, as well as um, the societal norms are somewhat different? How have you guys been able to address that in an effective manner? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and um, you know, the, the, a lot of erasure happens in, in the education system. And of course, you know that. Um, just recently, we were able to participate in uh, building a third grade curriculum um, that was told by Native people. And so I, I don't have a great example of how we can change the whole education system and bridge that gap, but I think it really is one situation at a time and providing the best education that, that we can. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer to that one, but we, we do our best to try to, to give truthful education from Native people by Native people um, so that, that that accurate information is shared in, in the education settings. And again, use my email if you think of a question later on that you have a burning desire to ask, I'd be happy to communicate with any of you. So 
thank you again for sharing space here with us today. And, and um, we look forward to uh, talking again soon. Thank you.